Sego. My name is Darren Bonaparte, and I'm from the Akwesasne Mohawk Territory. And I've been giving presentations about wampum and the use of wampum by our people uh, for the last 20 years or so. And if you had walked around the streets of Montreal 250 years ago, uh, the things I'm showing you now would have been actually common, commonplace and common uh, sight, things that people would have been used to. Because Montreal was actually a center for indigenous diplomacy. And for our people, and primarily the people that lived across the river at Gunawage, uh, they kind of became like the, uh, I guess, a place of meeting for indigenous people that had official business to do in Montreal. And so every now and then you would have a great big council where wampum belts were brought out. And not just native people made wampum belts, but also the colonies. Colonial officials, if they had any matters of importance to, to deal with with native people, they had to use wampum. And it is said that nobody would take you seriously unless you came with the proper wampum strings or the proper wampum belts woven to carry your message. We just wouldn't take you very seriously unless wampum was involved. Wampum created a covenant, an eternal bond between different parties that came together to make agreements or to negotiate or whatever. And sometimes these, um, uh, covenants that were made um, extended beyond our own borders to other territories. So when you made an alliance, all of your allies were also included in the alliance you made with other people. So you weren't just speaking for yourself or your home community, you were dealing with a greater range of territory. And Gunawage was considered the great council fire of an alliance known as the Seven Nations of Canada. And some of the belts that I'm going to show you are right here in the city of Montreal. Four of them are at the McCord Museum, which is just a short walk from where we are here at the McGill campus. Now this one, the first one I'm going to show you um, is a belt from the McCord collection that relates to the missionary activities here in uh, New France, as they called it. And some of the belts that you see um, have some symbolism in there that's very easy to figure out when you look at it. It makes perfect sense that this is a missionary belt. It's relating to an Indian mission in a native community. There's a cross at the center, which all missions did have. And over on the end, you see a, an actual church. It's, it's not too often that you see um, such blatant reproduction of symbolism. Sometimes it's more geometry, shapes, uh, squares, triangles, diamonds, different lines, and occasionally human beings depicted. But in this one, you see a church, you see missionaries, the ones with the long robes that reach to the ground. And then on the other side of the cross, you see indigenous people, and then a symbol representing the indigenous uh, culture. So that's what's depicted in a, a belt like this uh, missionary activity. So this is one of the collections that's, one of the belts that's in the McCord collection. And there are a couple others that I'd like to show you. This one relates no doubt, to an alliance that Gunawage sat at the center of, and it was called the Seven Nations of Canada. And you can see that there's uh, seven emblems joined by a chain. They're, they're links of a chain, basically. And if you look carefully at the seven um, emblems in there, um, it may take you a while, but eventually you'll realize that you're looking at a representation of a turtle. There's his shell, and there's his head, and his front legs, his hind legs, and his tail. And then there's a cross at the center of the shell. So basically a turtle is a symbol from our creation story. The world, the land we live on was at one time a turtle that rose up from the ocean depths. So our creation story is kind of invoked in this belt. And it relates to the missionary communities up and down the St. Lawrence River Valley that were part of this alliance. The Mohawks who were basically the, the top dogs of this alliance, had been part of the old Five Nations Confederacy down in what is now New York State. But they uh, emigrated to the St. Lawrence River Valley, which had been ancient hunting grounds for a lot of our people, and basically set up a new alliance with the indigenous people in the area. For instance, the First Nation of Odenak, the First Nation of Wendage, the Hurons of Lorette, as they're called, and also a community called Aswagachi, which was 
uh, no longer exists now, but at one time was located at what is uh, now Augensburg, New York, across the river from Prescott, Ontario. But there was a thriving Indian village of more than 3,000 people at one time. So we were all linked together into an alliance. I sometimes uh, wonder if, if they were um, a full confederacy or a full alliance along the lines of the Five Nations. Uh, we're still doing a lot of research into the documentary history of New France to see what was the real nature of this alliance. But Ganawage, no doubt, was at the heart of this alliance. They were the great council fire of this. So this is another one of the belts that is still in the McCord collection. It was collected some time ago. And a lot of times what the museums collect about the belts in their collections, uh, the information is a little bit dubious. We can sometimes take it at face value, and other times we have to challenge and question it. Another of the McCord belts is uh, this one here. And there's a famous lithograph of a Huron chief uh, holding this belt. And that image is actually in the McCord also. And this Huron chief is holding this belt. It has a diamond and also a hatchet or a tomahawk. You ever hear that expression, bury the hatchet? Well, it comes from native diplomacy. One of our teachings is that when they uh, originally created the Iroquois Confederacy, they uprooted a white pine tree and threw the weapons of war into that hole, reburied the pine tree, and that became the tree of peace. So what they're saying with this belt is that former enemies, who are represented by the bands on, on either side, came together at the Great Council Fire to make peace between them. They buried the hatchet between them. So people say that expression all the time. It's, it's kind of become like, you know, just um, um, kind of a standard thing. People, uh, uh, people don't realize, though, that it's straight from indigenous diplomacy. It's a historical artifact. So that's another one of the McCord belts that are in the collection, and you can make arrangements to go and visit them in person. Now, the fourth of the McCord belts is actually the largest known wampum belt in the world that still exists. In the historical records, they talk about belts being um, even bigger than this one, but this is the only one that we know still exists and is still intact. It's in the McCord collection. And this consists of over 13,000 beads. And that's a pretty monumental uh, creation. And it was a big deal to make a belt this large. And the story that we have about this belt comes from Gunasatage. And they claim that they made this belt when they originally established their community. Now, the community of Gunasatage, close to Oka, Quebec, is, has been in the news quite a bit. And in um, 1990, there was, of course, the Oka crisis. But Gunasatage goes back um, quite a long time. In fact, in the late 1600s, they were located right here in Montreal Island on Sherbrooke Street. And eventually they were told, hey, you guys are great where you are, but uh, could you move a little bit north and get, get out of the way of all the new settlers that we have coming in? So they relocated. And then a little while later, the same people came up and said, uh, could you move a little bit to the west this time? Because we have even more colonists that need land. So eventually they ended up at the banks of the Ottawa River, uh, the Lake of Two Mountains, and they established their village. Uh, and it wasn't just Haudenosaunee, Iroquois people, Mohawks, but also Nipissings and Algonquins. They lived in three separate neighbor neighborhoods in the same village. And so when they created their village, they made a great wampum belt to signify the charter of the community, the laws, the relationships. And so that's what you see depicted here is another mission belt. There's different kinds of people holding hands in a covenant chain. And that may represent the fact that there's not only French people, but indigenous people and three different kinds of indigenous people all living in one village. And they said that at the end of the belt, are placed dogs that will uh, guard the village and cry out if there's any uh, trouble that approaches. So that's a very special thing about uh, this belt is that they depict the dogs. And sometimes people call this the two dog belt because they're on, they're on both sides. And also at the end are seven bands. Seven is a sacred number to the Catholics. 
Uh, if you ever open up the Old Testament, the book of Revelations, the number seven reoccurs over and over and over. It's considered a, 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 a kind of important holy number. So they chose that as the, the number for the alliance of the seven nations. But there weren't always seven separate villages. Sometimes the number varied from time to time. So like I said, that's another of the belts that are in the McCord Museum in the collection. Sometimes they put it on display, like when there's a big event, uh, you may see that original belt come out. Now I want to talk about a couple other belts that are not in the McCord collection. This is a belt that uh, used to hang in the church in Gunawage, or should I say, this is a replica. All of my belts are just replicas of original belts. So uh, this is one that used to hang in the church in Gunawage, uh, dating back to 1676 and or 1677 in that era when uh, Huron Indians lived in Gunawage. And when they decided to move to Wendage near Quebec City, they gave this belt to Gunawage and they said, uh, build a solid church and guard against the demons that always try to destroy that which we build. And so this belt was draped over the altar in the little longhouse where they used to hold mass. Then they built that solid wooden church and draped this over the beams above the altar. And that church was destroyed in a tornado, believe it or not. And then they um, rebuilt it. And then they moved the village a couple times after that. Every time it was given that place of honor. So that continued right up until I believe the 1960s or the 1970s when somebody spirited the bell away from the church in Gunawage, and it hasn't been seen since. So I was able to make a reproduction of this belt by using old photographs that had been taken of the original. So at least it exists in this form anyway, but it is a very important belt. It has a cross at the center, just like the other belts, and it has uh, six symbols on each end um, in the negative space. That may have become the inspiration for the, the number seven in the Seven Nations of Canada, but this was actually created before there were a number of villages in the St. Lawrence River Valley. So that's another and very important belt uh, relating to the history of Gunawage and the Hurons and all the Catholic Ongwehongwe up and down the St. Lawrence River Valley. So I have a couple more. Now, at one time, the Seven Nations of Canada were on the side of the French, the colony of New France. They were their fighting allies, and they ended up going to war against their own Mohawk kin, who were still part of the old Iroquois Confederacy in New York State. Well, it wasn't New York State then. It was actually the colony of New York. So by the end of that conflict in the year 1760, um, it was pretty obvious to the people of the Seven Nations that Great Britain was going to win the war. And a three-pronged army uh, descended on Montreal, some coming from the um, from Quebec City area, some coming from the Albany area up the Lake Champlain corridor, and then others coming from Lake Ontario heading downriver on the St. Lawrence. So our people living up and down the St. Lawrence realized very quickly that the British were going to win. So we made a deal with them. We cut a deal. And so the British decided if our people stand down and don't fire upon the, the British troops as they descend the river, then they'll enter into a new covenant chain with uh, Great Britain. So the Seven Nations of Canada switched sides from the French to the British in the summer of 1760. And then shortly after the fall of Montreal, a great peace council was held at Gunawage. And this is where I believe we received this belt. It's called the Wolf Belt because of the it looks like wolves on each end, but um, it's actually a covenant chain of peace and friendship between the Seven Nations of Canada and Great Britain and the Iroquois Confederacy because we had previously been a part of the, the covenant chain alliance until the war broke out and then everything went haywire. So they patched up their differences, they exchanged wampum belts, and that's where I am convinced that this is where we received that belt from the British and the Iroquois Confederacy, welcoming us back into this alliance. So that's what we call the Wolf Belt. This belt, the real one, is currently in the Akwesasne Museum where I live. Well, I don't live in the museum, but it's in my community. And it's on display, anybody can go and see it. The unique thing about this real belt is that it has traces of red ochre 
in the, the leather thongs that hold the thing together. Red ochre was what we used to paint ourselves for war paint. And we also decorated a lot of our things with uh, red ochre. And we would sometimes paint a wampum belt to turn it into a war belt by painting red ochre on it. So there's traces of red ochre on the original wolf belt. So after we accepted the alliance relationship with Great Britain, uh, we were called to fight on their side in the American Revolution. For instance, we drove out the American invasion of the Montreal area in 1775 at the Battle of Cedars. And uh, most people aren't even taught about that event, but it did happen. Long before the Americans even signed their Declaration of Independence, they decided to invade Montreal and didn't work out so well. But anyway, so a hundred people from my community came out to be a part of that effort. So here's the wolf belt. It was probably used to entice us to go and fight on the side of Great Britain in not only the American Revolution, but also in the War of 1812, which came a few, uh, a few short years later. So that's a very important and a very special belt. Uh, there was an old lady who had this in her possession back in the late 1800s. And she told a researcher who came to look at the belt uh, that it meant uh, the, following, um, the following words were associated with the belt. Uh, we will live together or we will die together. We promise this as long as water runs, skies do shine, and night brings rest. So those were the words that she said went with this belt. So that's the way people were. They remembered word for word what a lot of the wampum belts said. So finally, my last belt that I want to show you today is another Seven Nations belt that was probably given to the Iroquois Confederacy at that same Peace Council where we got those other two belts. And this belt has seven pretty obvious crosses on it and also a crooked path at the bottom. Now, the people at Onondaga who preserved this belt and kept it in their collections for years and years uh, said that it was given to them by the Seven Nations of Canada to mark a peace between the two uh, groups of people. And that they said that the bottom of the belt, the crooked path, represented the, uh, the fact that these indigenous people of the seven nations were uh, following the priests. The path of the priests was crooked and that they promised to straighten their path for, you know, ever since. But I don't believe that. I don't think that's quite the right interpretation. Uh, when I took that belt and I turned it on its side, I realized it wasn't a crooked path, but it was a depiction of mountains. Now, there's a lot of mountains between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Seven Nations Territory called the Adirondack Mountains. There's also a great big, um, two great big mountains or hills behind Gunasatage called, and they call the whole region the Lake of Two Mountains. So there's two mountains and what appears to be a lake between them. So that's what I think is being depicted here, is not a crooked path of some priests, but actually the landscape. They're trying to convey the territory where they lived. And so that's a very, really cool belt, um, an important one. And it's back in Onondaga today. It was repatriated to them. So those belts help tell the story of how wampum was a big way of documenting alliances, historical events, and just about anything important. And so uh, the Montreal area still does have some wampum for anybody who's interested in searching it out, like just go to the McCord Museum and they might be able to show you the, the ones. They're usually kept in a vault, but every now and then one or two of them might get uh, brought out into a display. So that's kind of uh, one of the things that I like to focus on when I give talks about wampum, which I've been doing for McGill uh, probably almost 20 years now. Uh, every year I give a, a course uh, in wampum and diplomacy and the cultural uses for various programs here at the university. So I love that relationship that I've cultivated with McGill. And I try to remind them of the heritage that is right in their own neighborhood so that everybody can at least take a step back in time and see um, that at one time relationships were governed by a spirituality and an eternal commitment that was always present. And so when you make a wampum belt and give it to somebody else, that is uh, the most serious thing you can do. And if you were to ever approach somebody and ask them to uh, 
uh, be a part of an alliance or any kind of agreement with them. If you didn't come carrying wampum, they wouldn't even listen to you. They wouldn't even entertain your thoughts. This was the ticket into indigenous territory. If you had it, you might have a good chance of making some friends there. So anyway, I'd like to wrap it up at that point. And I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to share this bit of our culture with you today. Yawagoa. <laughs>